So thank you for taking the time to come to this talk or talks. And for those who have joined online, uh, welcome. And this is my great pleasure to introduce um, the two students who will be presenting today. But before I do that, you know, I uh, just want to set the stage, like the background of what motivated them to do this or what motivated me to encourage them to do this. So you might have seen uh, this graphic in many places. Uh, we always talk about active learning, you know. So this is a spectrum they call, like at the easiest thing you can incorporate in the classroom all the way up to the top, the most difficult one. I participated as a LAMP scholar in 2019 and I learned about many of these techniques and they encouraged us to incorporate them in our classroom. So I was doing our mentoring undergrad before, but I was able to align some of these principles. So the first one is problem-based learning. So where you present a problem to a student and then the student is required to go and dig the concepts from lectures, labs, and so on and then apply them to solve the problem. Or the second one would be what's called place-based learning. So you take the student to a place, you tell them what is happening or what they are facing. And then once again, the student applies the concepts from classes to solve those problems. So today, we will see a sample of those two methods. One will be problem-based, and the second one will be place-based. So this is just to, for all the instructors out there, I just wanted to uh, put a pep. If you have not participated in the LAMP program, I would encourage everyone to do so. Uh, it's a great program through the UW Science Initiative. Uh, please contact Dr. Rachel Watson, who directs that program. And uh, in a classroom, this is really good because um, what I do in the first 10 weeks, everybody does the same thing. And then based on how much interest, dedication, hard work they put in, I pull some of those students out and then I challenge them with these type of problems, okay? So, this gives opportunity for those who really want to go beyond to take advantage of, they're not bored in the classroom by just doing our scripted labs. They get an opportunity to try something new. As an instructor, we get to learn a lot of new things. And in the sense, it's not like, yeah, everybody did the same thing in the class, okay? So with that, I will stop and introduce the first speaker. Um, who will talk about a problem-based uh, research that she did. Without further ado, Devon, and she's the one who's going to AHE next week. All right, so I did my research on determining some analyst bias when determining optimal threshold values in flood mapping. Uh, so first, some background. On just floods in general, they are increasing worldwide as a result of climate change. We're seeing them all over the place, uh, an increase in the amount happening per year and their intensity. And um, there's been an estimated global average annual loss of $651 billion just from riverine flooding. So that doesn't account for other types of flooding like urban or coastal. So you can see kind of the scale of what we're dealing with. And between 1951 and 2020, there were more than 10,000 floods that uh, that resulted in 10 or more fatalities. So that could be a flood that just has 10 fatalities or it could, could be upwards of thousands. So we're seeing very large loss of life and economic loss, but uh, remote sensing can be used to support the response and recovery during these events. And uh, rapid flood mapping specifically can provide updates to uh, first responders and personnel working these events to potentially lessen the loss of life and economic losses. However, the caveat is during these disasters, we tend to have access or limited access to personnel with remote sensing experience that are available to process images for these floods. So it's become really important that we have uh, techniques that we can just hand off to uh, volunteers with limited experience and have them work 
uh, on those without training. So uh, previously, Ramesh's labs have been working on a rapid flood mapping technique to identify newly inundated areas um, using these multispectral satellite images. The goal of this was to isolate uh, existing water bodies so we can kind of narrow down areas for uh, recovery and response efforts. But previously, they've just been working on um, 12 sites to identify those newly inundated areas and under different flooding conditions to see how that works. Uh, here on the right, we have some examples of some of the uh, maps that have been created between the two journal articles that have been published. There have also been some students doing offshoot research, uh, such as in like Nigeria, working on flooding there to see if this technique works in different uh, situations. Um, this technique is done through water differencing uh, or through image differencing of water indexes. So we take post and pre-flood water index images and difference them from each other to create a change index. And so we would look at these increases, the newly inundated areas where it was land and is now water. And we highlight those to then uh, move on to isolate them from previous water bodies. So we leave out these decreases and minimal changes where we had water and it's now land or land to land, water to water, where we see that minimal change. And once we've done that, we then try and find the optimal threshold value. So a value between zero and 100% that only includes those new newly inundated areas and leaves out the existing water bodies. So you can see that we have this image that's 0% where we have a lot of most of the pixels are highlighted. So we have that over prediction of the newly inundated areas and 100% uh, above that, that under predicts the, the newly inundated areas where none of the pixels are highlighted. So we're trying to find the happy medium between those two, where we're only getting our area of interest, that newly inundated flood area. And that brings me to my research question that I've been working on. Um, if we have multiple analysts and we give them the same pair of pre, pre and post flood images, can they arrive at sim the same or similar OTVs? And to do this, we took six analysts that were a part of uh, classes that I was part of or other of uh, Ramesh's classes. And they all come from different backgrounds. They have different experience in remote sensing. And uh, we had them determine OTVs for these image pairs. So we had imagery from three sites that we labeled A, B, and C. And we put three analysts per site. So we ended up being able to record our three OTV values per site and the time taken for each site per analyst. And that looks like this. So each analyst received a set of water indices from Landsat imagery, the pre and the post flood. Um, and they were from NDWI and MNDWI indices. And this little uh, chart here shows off uh, how we assigned those uh, sites. So for example, uh, for the, the highlighted areas indicate somewhere where an analyst was assigned a site. So for example, A1 is analyst one, and that person was assigned site A and C in NDWI and site B in MNDWI. So this assured that uh, no one analyst was just getting NDWI or MNDWI. They all got a mixture of both. And once they received their images, they performed that differencing technique. Uh, we had them start at 50% to kind of streamline the process so they were not just going willy-nilly all over the place. Um, once they got that 50% threshold value map, um, they would look at it and determine if it overestimated the newly flooded areas or underestimated them. If it overestimated them, they would increase it to 75% to take out some of those uh, pixels. And if it underestimated them, they would reduce it to 25% to allow more in. And they would continue this moving by midpoints, like by halves, so between 25 and 50, 25 and zero, until they determine that the OTV gives them what they want. Once they finished that, they uh, submitted their OTVs and the time taken, and we began to calculate the mean and standard deviation of those OTVs to just compare them better and uh, recorded the time taken. And then I created maps that cal to calculate the inundation area to better have like a spatial idea of what the OTVs actually mean on the ground. Um, and also to have a visual representation of them so we could see any visual differences. For our results, let's start with site, uh, site A. 
Uh, for site A, we only have these two images because two of our analysts actually determined that 25% was their optimal threshold, which is fantastic. Um, the other person determined that 31.25% was the threshold value for them. And that is also great. They're within a similar range of each other. They're not super far off. We can also see that reflected in the area. The area is only like roughly 2,000 hectares off of each other. So we can see that even within, uh, uh, spatially on the ground, the OTV values wouldn't impact uh, the groundwork as much if handed off to somebody. Uh, as far as the time taken, we don't see too much variation, but that does vary between the other sites. But moving on to site B, similarly, our OTV values are all within a similar range as reflected kind of within the area. Um, they're all pretty close together. There's not one that's greater than the other. And our time taken has a little bit more variation, but generally is still within that same range. And for site C, once again, the OTVs are pretty close together within a similar range um, seen in the area. And our time taken has greater variation, but only within uh, analyst three. It could have multiple reasons of why that happened. But overall, the general big picture is that we see low anal uh, analyst bias for MDWI. All of the OTVs are pretty close together. We don't see too much variation between them, which is really great. It shows uh, some great promise for this technique. We do see high variation in the time taken, but that could be related to experience level or flooding type. Um, some people had a little bit more experience with this technique than others, and some of the tech flooding types could have been a little bit more difficult to view and process. But um, our MNDWI results are really interesting when we look at MDWI or MNDWI. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this because we've been focusing on NDWI primarily this semester, but uh, we see almost the exact opposite with MNDWI. Our OTVs for this index are highly varied. They, um, with the exception of site C being slightly closer together, but still not within the same ranges that we see with NDWI. Um, I find it interesting that even within these maps created, you can see a little bit more visual difference between them. When you look at those NDWI maps, you don't notice right off the right off the bat that there's a lot of difference between them, but you can see it within these ones. And also interestingly enough, and still an opposite, uh, opposite and compared to NDWI, it took less time to complete these uh, OTVs. So it will be interesting to maybe look at that in the future. So our next steps is I have been determining the accuracy for these NDWI OTV images. That's been what I've been working on primarily this semester. It's part of my undergraduate research. Uh, and then in the future, we could look into those MNDWI OTVs, determine why they're just so different. Um, there is a possibility it could be related to turbid versus clear water and how that relates to how the index uh, is operates within the spectrum. Or it could be an analyst issue. Um, we have more notes left from the analysts about what they struggled with or what they found easy. And so it could be within that that they've said, well, these ones were just really hard for me to process. So they didn't spend as much time or something along that lines. But either way, no matter how we uh, continue working, on this in the fall, I will be coming back and doing more flood mapping research as part of my master's in GIST. So I'm looking forward to continuing working on stuff like this. But um, in conclusion, we have found that these NDWI, uh, this technique used with NDWI um, can be given to volunteers with limited processing experience and we can get similar outputs that could be used in a disaster, which is really great. Um, in general, working on this research has really shown me that uh, indices are super simple tools and this technique is super simple, it does not take a lot of time to do, but it really solves an important problem and that's super fascinating to see and I'm excited to be working on something like that. Uh, it's also been really great in cementing some of the concepts that I've learned in class. Uh, we began working on this preliminarily uh, in the fall of uh, last semester or the end of last semester. And while we were doing it, I would make these connections during class, like, oh, I've been working on that with Ramesh for the last couple of semesters, or that's what I'm going to be doing next semester. And so it would make it more exciting that I'm like, oh, I'm so excited. I get to practice this before I do it next semester. 
or somebody sitting next to me would ask me a question about what we were doing. And I could say, oh yeah, I did this before. This is how you do it. And I wouldn't need to address the, the steps that we were given. So it's been really nice to actually like apply this information rather than just following the instructions and then having to maybe recall it in the future. But I would like to acknowledge the OTD analysts that helped me with this. I really couldn't have done it without them. Um, they are also the co-authors on my AAG poster that I'll be presenting next week in Honolulu. So thank you to them. And also I'd like to acknowledge the Wyoming View internship uh, for allowing me to do this kind of research and providing some support in the research. Questions or yeah. oh, sorry. adding things? Okay. Thanks, Ramesh. I really enjoyed your talk, and uh, I think you did uh, a lot of really good stuff. Uh, I have one quick question. Uh, is this kind of work typically done by individuals or teams? If it's the latter, would you consider as part of your future work to pay some of your analysts so that you investigate the impact on, on the results? My understanding, a lot of this work is done by individuals. Um, they'll create the images and then give them out to other people. So we were primarily doing this to uh, make sure that if individuals were working on it separately, they were getting similar outcomes. So I think that's the primary focus. It would be interesting to see if it works out in teams as well, but uh, for this study specifically, the other analysts didn't have know who got what other images or what their values were. Yeah, so I was wondering, I, I liked the presentation, um, I was wondering though, is the, the, are those maps from drones or is that from uh, Landsat or something? Or Landsat, yeah. Landsat. Mm -hmm. and, then, and I guess in the next uh, um, follow on, I was wondering uh, the start, when you'd start and end the time, because it's like, well, if they got to go out and collect the drone data and then turn that into a map and then do the thing and then finally apply the, that's, that could be hours if you're really good. But <laughs> you might have Ramesh help me with this one a little bit because that goes back oh, into your... Yeah. No, no, it's fine. I think um, so this work is directly related to the disaster charter. Um, so these are operated by 19 space agencies. So when their satellites come over an affected area, they collect the image and we do put it in a place. And then whoever is appointed as project manager it's their job to find volunteers to do these maps, okay? So I was scrambling to find people. Uh, so that motivated me to do this method in the first place. And then the question was, what if, if I had given that map to somebody else, you know? So primarily this is based on satellites because the charter focus is mostly on satellite data. So I think that's you had a slide that showed um, like increase or decrease mm -hmm. land to water, water to land. Will you just double check and make sure that it is showing what you're trying to say? Because I feel like what you said was not what was re represented because it had like water with an arrow to land as an increase. Okay. So you can blame that on me and you <laughs> bring that slide up. <laughs> but uh, the caption is the tricky one. So you see that, yeah. okay, there you go, you can explain. Go on. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, a little confusing because normally you would think you want to put pre-flood versus po first and then post-flood first. So, but we have post-flood first. And so it's in the post-flood it's water and then in the pre-flood it's land. So that's an increase because we're okay. like subtracting post-flood from pre-flood. That, right. yeah. so that is confusing. Yeah, it's like <laughs> and it, a mathematical way of seeing it, I guess, rather than the... Yes, yeah, so when you do your presentation, you should make sure that you indicate that the post is listed first and the pre is listed second, because it was a little confusing to me. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Yeah, I'm a total novice for this stuff, and I wonder, you, you talked about it being rapid kind of response. Could you tell me a little bit about the timescales, like how this happens, like there, there's a flood and then there's a rush to make the maps. And so how, how long does, how long are those time periods? Like how long after a flood do you get the imagery? And then how long do you get the, how long does it take? Yeah, I have much told you a little bit with this one too, because I'm still new to all of this stuff. This is kind of my first dip into it. 
and he works with the charter. So, yeah. so it's literally we get within hours, we get maybe hundreds of images. You know, wow. There are so many satellites that we, they will contribute. And so the first responders are already screaming at us. Okay, where are the images? You know, we need products. <laughs> so this is a different type of mapping because we do one at the end called cumulative mapping. That's different. We take more time to do it, but these things have to be delivered very quickly. So when you say hours, like two hours. Yeah. So the end the response we get is yesterday. You know, that's what the first responders will say. What is taking you long? You know, but we try our best to get within hours. And so then what is taking you long? Um, for that? I mean, why two hours and not a second? So the, uh, because each flooding is different. So like, for example, as Devon mentioned, the student from Nigeria who tried this technique on uh, a flood in Northern Nigeria got the exact opposite. Uh, I think water clarity has something to do with it, how it affects the index. So we are still learning all these, and the goal is eventually to take it to machine learning mm -hmm. so that we use all these as data points to train that product. You know, that's a long run. So the time is really, I mean, it's not because you don't have the data. The data is available mm -hmm. immediately. How, how often does the satellite update the data? Is that every five minutes or something? It depends on the satellite. It depends on the satellite that you're using. On how often they go over that specific spot, that's also part of the issue is you can't just have one that gets it every five minutes. So you need it to be there uh -huh. like at the right spot. And then the reason it takes a couple of hours is because you need user, you need an expert who needs to be able to interpret somehow. Exactly. That's why we need this okay. to be uh, so, so the yeah. aim is to be able to replicate that expert information somehow in a computer system. Exactly. Yeah. And then uh, just to add. I understand one thing. The, the other question is, you know, during emergency, um, it will be interesting to notice suddenly DOD will say, use these images. And then we never knew these satellites existed. <laughs> uh, they just show up out of nowhere. And then they have to realize, oh, you are not a US citizen. Sorry, we can't show it to you. <laughs> so that's how it works. So thank you. Any other questions for Ivan? Okay, I'll just a question and a comment. Um, the example that you used, the image, did you mention where that actually was or from what event it was? Maybe yeah. I just missed it. Um, I did not. I actually don't know they're from Ramesh's paper, and I meant to ask him again <laughs> about it before this, but then I forgot. Yes. Oh, no, yeah. So, okay. Well, I just, just as a comment, I think that would be of interest to mm -hmm. an audience to sort of know what, where the example is from. Yeah. <laughs> and then just another comment. and. You're doing a poster next week, right? So not this, but, um, and I think we all get this a lot, but um, in in our field, the, the tendency to overuse um, acronyms <laughs> and, um, and that we just sort of assume that everybody knows them. And so just sort of something to keep in mind. Um, it's hard to avoid them because um, you don't want to have a lot of text on a slide, right? But but sometimes you'll have folks in the audience that just like have no clue what an OTV is and they see it once and then they don't remember. So just a, just a suggestion. Tom, <laughs> any questions online? No. Okay, so once again, we'll thank uh, Devon for having uh, you in the GIFT program this fall. Okay, great. Okay, the next speaker um, is truly, uh, you know, an example of a multidisciplinary person. So she started in, or she's still in international studies, and she is also doing her second major in ENR or ESS, one or the other. And she took my class last spring, and I was able to convince her that, yeah, remote sensing is the way to go. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I'd like to invite Anna to talk about, uh, so this is a problem-based, uh, sorry, place-based, I got this too, okay, place-based <laughs> approach where she is um, going to tell you her visit to the ranch and then how she built all this one. Okay, take it away.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Anastasia, and my remote sensing work has focused on using multi-temporal Landsat images to identify variations in crop growth. All right, so set the stage. Let's uh, picture yourself as a farmer, and you've got two fields. One has a nice even medium growth all the way across. The other has some areas of really high growth and some areas of really low growth. Over time, you've noticed that you maybe get higher payouts from the field with even growth, even though you might think that the field or that the high growth would cancel out the low growth. You know that some causes of variation can be access to water or pests or uneven fertilizer application or soil types and nutrients, but you're not sure exactly what's causing the variation. And the first thing you've got to do is make sure you're identifying all the areas of variation so you can get down to identifying the problem. To identify the areas of low growth, traditionally, you would go out into the field with a field guide or field notes and sample individual plants. Um, lately, there's been a big push for handheld technology that can be brought out into the field. But both of these, like, they're very time consuming and you can only see a few plants at a time. Um, and they're just not very efficient at all. So that's where remote sensing can come in. Uh, there's different types of sensors. Active sensors would be ones that emit their own electromagnetic radiation and then record what is reflected, such as the flash of a camera. Uh, and then the passive sensors just record the incoming radiation from another source, such as the sun. Uh, imaging and non-imaging sensors, so the non-imaging ones could be like temperature or the radar guns that the police use to test, or to test your speed as you're you know, whizzing by. Um, and there's different resolutions associated with different sensors as well. The spectral resolution is the uh, just the range of the electromagnetic spectrum that's being recorded by the sensor. The spatial is the dimension of a single pixel within the image. Uh, the temporal is the time between data acquisitions. And then the radiometric is the numbers associated with storing the data. And then there's different types of platforms as well. So like YDOT uses towers to monitor I-80 to decide if it needs to be closed or not based on the weather. And then uh, this is Landsat 8 here, one of the satellites that I've been using for my work. And then there's airplanes, drones, balloons, and kites. And they're all really cool and offer different benefits and uh, negative aspects that you just have to kind of consider when you're choosing what platform and sensor to use for your work. So why should we use satellites? Why did I use satellites? Um, well, one of the things is the repeat coverage. A lot of satellites are constantly recording data, but you just have to wait for them to orbit around to the area of interest again. There's a variety of sensors on plat or on satellites, uh, including in the visible region, the true color, the red, green, and blue that we can see, as well as beyond the visible region in the infrared, whether that be near infrared or short wave infrared or long infrared, you know, there's lots of different areas that are being recorded all at the same time. In addition, you can often combine the data from different satellites to get a more comprehensive understanding of what is going on in the area of interest. Um, but sometimes the resolutions from different satellites are incompatible, so you just have to keep that in mind and be aware of it. For example, Landsat 8 and 9 have 30 square meter uh, pixels for the spatial resolution, whereas some uh, European Space Agency satellites have 10 square meter pixels. And so you can still use data from both, but maybe in different ways and you have to account for that difference, you know? And another big con with satellites is cloud cover. Because they're only coming around every few days or every few weeks or something, you just have to be aware that you might not be able to get the data right when you need it because there might be clouds and they're high above the atmosphere. So it can be an issue. So, uh, each of the different regions that sensors record in, we refer to them as bands. I'm sure many of you here might know that, but maybe not everyone on Zoom, I don't know. Uh, so for example, red, green, and blue are all different bands on satellites. And so this true color image in the middle, the red pixels are being, just, or the red band is being displayed in the red pixels of the screen, blue and blue and green and green, but with different combinations of the bands, you can display different or highlight different features. So false color infrared makes the vegetation appear red, 
pseudo color infrared makes it appear green, but not quite the natural green. And so, like I said, you can just use it to highlight different features, whether that be the vegetation or the water or the bare ground or whatever you need to study. So a lot of people are really familiar with multispectral analyses, uh, which is how a pixel changes or varies across the electromagnetic spectrum. So for example, with the grass here in the visible spectrum, there's a spike right here where the green is. That's why grass appears green because it reflects green light. And there's a slight uh, increase in the blue for the water, but it's not really noticeable because water absorbs a lot of radiation. Um, so this is the, the multispectral curve. But my work has been multi-temporal, uh, which is how it's looking at how pixels change over time in one or more regions of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and these the times can be consistent or kind of random depending on your sensor. Uh, so you could have like one image a day, a week, a month, a year, or like Landsat 8 and 9, they each record data uh, once every 16 days for is the, the temporal resolution for the same area. But when you combine the two of them, you get data once every eight days. Uh, so yeah. So my area of interest has been the 9H Ranch, which stretches from North Laramie all the way up to Bosler, Wyoming. They have both irrigated and non-irrigated fields, but I've been focusing on the irrigated fields. Uh, specifically, I've been doing field one and field four. I have a colleague who's been doing field three. And our goal has been to identify the areas of poor and low growth so that the managers can take action and improve their crop yields. So I have taken the surface reflectance derived spectral indices from Landsat 8 and 9. So these are the pre-made NDVI products. So I didn't have to create the, the normalized difference vegetation index images, which the, the normalized difference vegetation index, it measures the crop growth and uh, it deals with uh, near infrared and the red bands. You just perform arithmetic op operations on those bands for each pixel. Luckily, we've got programs that can do this for us, so we don't have to do the math for each pixel. Um, and they produce black and white images, and the brighter the white, the, the higher the growth rates, and darker the color, the, the lower the growth is. Um, uh, but as you can see, I skipped 2021 here. That's because there was cloudy. It was cloudy that day. Uh, but the rest of the images were taken between July 11th and July 18th. But it's cloudy during that time frame in 2021. So we had to take an earlier image. So the growth rates were lower, like all the way across, and it just ended up producing outliers for every pixel. And so we removed it. Um, uh, but so I took the four, the four NDVI images and combined them in a multi-temporal stack. So that made it so that each index image acted like a band in the display. So for this multi-temporal image, 2019 was assigned to the red pixels, 2020 was assigned to the blue pixels, and 2022 was assigned to the green pixels. You can kind of see like right here, it's very bright, very white still, so still high growth rates. You can kind of see the a little bit of red and a little bit of blue over here, very slight variations. It'd be easier to see on a screen with higher contrast, but um, so I showed the example multispectral and multitemporal curves earlier. This was the multitemporal curve specific to this field. Um, I took the, the image and ran it through an unsupervised classification, which just groups the pixels into similar reflectance patterns and then into clusters of the similar reflectance patterns. And uh, then I would use the multi-temporal signature of each cluster to determine which class it should go in. So the green was very consistent all the way across all four years. Uh, the brown was pretty low. There was still some variation, but still very low. And then the, uh, the tan, which it's kind of orange, it's hard to see in this background, so I apologize, but uh, it was 
expected growth rates and kind of in the middle of the, the high growth and the low growth. So it, the, the growth dipped in drought years and was higher in wet years, but that was of interest because as I said, it's an irrigated field. So we shouldn't really be seeing variation like that. Um, and then the yellow was very unexpected. It was higher growth in the drought years and lower growth in the wet years. So that's another area that could be looked at, but maybe isn't of the most concern because maybe it won't produce the best, or maybe maybe addressing it won't like increase crop yields that much. I don't know. And then this was the map, uh, same color coding. And uh, so there's the, the consistent low growth was pretty small in total, um, but there's a lot of the tan area. So that's a lot of area that the managers could address and try to improve their crop yields. Uh, and what I found really interesting was that the yellow kind of follows the pattern of the Little Laramie River. And so maybe that explains why it was higher growth or higher, yeah, higher growth in wet years and lower in drought years. Um, and you can also kind of see it on the, the multi-temporal NDVI image as well. Um, so this data has some wide ranging implications for the managers of the ranch. For example, there's a long historical record of satellite data going all the way back to 1984. If the managers want to see um, all the annual variations of the crop growth, uh, they can use this data to target the areas for management and take action on those areas, as well as uh, like looking into the causes of the variation, whether that be pests or water access or soil nutrients or whatever. And then it's also much more time efficient than going into the field and collecting data on individual plants and trying to like average that across the whole field. My work has also really highlighted the benefits of satellite remote sensing for me. Uh, I mentioned the, the observation history going all the way back to 1984. Um, and then because of the, the large swath of satellite images, you can see the whole field or multiple fields at one time instead of like with drone images being more focused, but maybe you want to be more focused in some, uh, some instances. And then the variety of sensors on satellites makes it easier to highlight the different features that you want to focus on. Uh, in an image, instead of having to take multiple images to highlight different features. Uh, this shows the, the different ranges that the sensors on Landsat 8 up top and Landsat 7 on the bottom are uh, recording. And so for example, for Landsat 8, 2 is the blue, 3 is the green, and uh, band 4 is the red. But the best part about satellite data is that a lot of it is free and accessible through the U.S. Geological Survey, so it's pretty neat. Um, as Devon had mentioned, uh, learning about all these concepts in class and in labs just was like, all right, I understand what's being said to me, but why does it matter? So getting the chance to go out to the ranch and like using these concepts to produce real results made it more uh, applicable and made it easier to connect to. So even though this wasn't a multispectral analysis, I still had to have an understanding of red and infrared and how they interact and how features interact with electromagnetic radiation. Uh, the spatial resolution goes hand in hand with the minimum mapping unit, which is just like the smallest uh, area that the managers are able to take action on and address because maybe 30 square meters is too big or maybe it's too small for them to make an impact on a single pixel. And then additionally, uh, these brown spots on the bottom here, maybe it's not simply poor growth, maybe it's a mix of vegetation and bare ground like a road or something. So that's something that would need to be like, we need to have confirmed field data to know what was really going on there. And then the temporal resolution, has been really important. Even though I was just taking one image from every year, we could do more images, do like the variation over one summer 
or see how it's different every June and every July and every August. And then of course, having to remove 2021 was, it made it very interesting to seeing the difference after we took that out. Additionally, um, not only have I uh, identified the areas of poor growth, but we're also comparing my analysis with that of a partner university in India where they're looking at the machine learning analysis of the fields. So like I mentioned, I did an unsupervised clustering technique where the, the program grouped the pixels into clusters of similar reflectance patterns. So the benefit of that is that I get to choose the number of clusters. So the first iteration, uh, I was expecting 10 classes. So I did 50 clusters because the, the rule of thumb is kind of, you take the number of expected classes, multiply it by three to five, um, but then after classifying that first iteration, I only ended up with four classes. So the next iteration, I did 20 classes, four times five. Um, and that just wasn't enough variation between the clusters. So I just kind of arbitrarily upped it to 30 and that worked out really well. And then in addition to the number of clusters, I can also, uh, I also have control over the location, uh, like the, where the, pixels are, if they should be their own class or not. So like if there was one cluster that only had like three pixels and it was surrounded by pixels from another class, I could just group that with the surrounding class, especially if the minimum mapping unit is larger than an individual pixel. Um, but so this decision-making can be really subjective. So for example, having gone out to the field, I knew that the Little Laramie River went through it. And so once I saw that, I kind of knew like, oh, it's the, the growth rates are gonna be different around there. Um, so that is one benefit of the machine learning approach is that there's no uh, subjectivity in the clustering at least. Um, they just put the <laughs> data into a program and it decides the number of clusters but they ended up with 70 clusters, which was quite a bit. And some of them were just like splitting hairs. They were very similar. Um, and it's much easier for them to repeat this for different data sets. So like it was much faster for them to take out 2021 than it was for me because I had to completely start over and they just had to feed the program new images. But they still require analyst interpretation, someone still has to go in and be like, yep, this cluster is this class, this cluster is this class. So similar to how I had to do that as well. And I need to thank Kenzie. She's my colleague that's been working on field number three. She's been a big help with all this. Paul, the director of the 9-H Foundation Ranch, Ranch, 9-H Ranch Foundation, for giving me a tour of the ranch and letting me use the ranch for my, for my project and just letting me learn more about crop growth, so I didn't know much before this project. I also need to thank the Wyoming View Internship Program, like Devon, I've been a, an intern with them uh, since the spring of 2023, and then Ramesh deserves a huge shout out as well for being my mentor and guiding me through this process and helping me and being there for any question I might have. Questions for Anna? Right, this time we like, yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, great presentation. Um, I had a couple. Uh, are you doing a poster as well? No, no, no? just oh. the one. Okay, I was gonna say because your your infographics might look different when it's printed out too. So like, it <laughs> might be a good thing to try. But I wanted to suggest too that maybe the Esri color rounds. If you, I don't know if you're familiar, but if you Google that, it, it, they got a huge page just on cool colors that go well together. If you want them to be grouped up separately or if you want to show a change like so that kind of mental stuff is done so maybe might help out with your with your chart showing on screens yeah um, me. yeah i mean it's uh it's just a you know it's a it's happened to everyone i think <laughs> you're like i can't see my chart <laughs> <laughs> um and then also i was wondering too just on the analysis the uh you said the river uh, runs runs through or that might be a road I'll, I'll, Curious, maybe future work. What if you knew where the path of that river was, and then you crop that out or you know, mask it out of the image, and then do the grouping, like kind of pre-processing bit, um, and, uh, and then also maybe and then when you said the cloudy 
it's uh, I was just wondering why I determined that part of July. Like, what was the time frame? Why so significant? Here in Wyoming, um, the snow typically starts to finally melt late April, early May, and then we get one more snowstorm around Mother's Day. Um, so the plants don't really start germinating until late May, early June. So in order to see like good crop growth rates, we had to kind of wait until early July after they've been growing for a little bit, but before the big droughts started coming. Okay, so that just makes sense. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Uh, your lens at image is, is the resolution of 30 meters, right? And that's as big as maybe this room, which means that there are going to be multiple crops within that space. How do you deal with uh, within pixel variation in, in, in growth? Are you detecting that at all or not at all? Um, well, so the 9-H Ranch, uh, their, their fields are mostly just to grow feed for their own cattle. And if they have a surplus, they'll sell it off. Um, but it's not like, for this ranch, they're not growing like corn or canola to just for profit. Um, uh, but if the, if the managers did wanna see specific variations, that would, we could go to like a drone for that and have a smaller spatial resolution. I was wondering if you can say anything about what the future of, of Landsat is, like a new, yes. and, and what that would mean for what you'd be able to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't plan this. <laughs> uh, I meant to mention that, but, uh, in 2030, Landsat Next will go up. So it's a series of three satellites that will have identical resolutions. Uh, and that'll, what's the res time, temporal resolution gonna be for just Landsat Next? Yeah, so by itself, when the three satellites go up, it will bring it down to five days. Uh, and, but the cool thing is the characteristics will match the European Space Agency Sentinel series. So they plan to operate two and US will operate three. So it will come down to every two days. Yeah. Every two days we'll be able to get it. So we're using days. both uh, the ESA satellites and the uh, uh, the US Sentinel system, or sorry, the Sentinel and the uh, Landsat yeah. systems. It'll be an option, yeah. So that'll make it that'll make cloud cover nearly not an issue yeah. whatsoever. And then what will be the impact of that on what you can like what you can learn about crops? Um, well, we'll be able to like have a much closer monitoring of the variation. So, like, if you if a problem comes up, you'll be able to uh, identify it and address it very quickly. Um, oh, I had another thought. Uh, the spatial resolution. So from 30 by 30, it will go down to? 10 meters squared. So it's going to be smaller. So that and addresses adding to that question. Did you uh, at all, and this probably wasn't a part of it, but just thinking, so I'm a geologist, and so looking at either the soils map or the geologic map associated with some of your unexpected changes. That's like, something, definitely something that I'm interested in. and. Uh, Especially if the manager, if the ranch managers do want to look at what's causing the variation as opposed to just identifying the variation, that would be very beneficial to, to look into. It might be that some soils hold water longer so that you know, give growth even in drought times or yeah. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah, one question in the back first and then next to you. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, for the irrigated areas, if it's a center pivot. Are those corners gonna mess up the analysis? Like the corners that aren't irrigated? These fields, none of these fields are center pivots. Oh. Uh, the 9 H Ranch Foundation does have center pivots in some other locations. Um, but these, they've got like just irrigated pipes to right. grow throughout the fields, so. Okay, one, two, three, four. Yeah. So I know uh, earlier this, you mentioned that you chose uh, satellite data uh, specifically due to the benefits, uh, especially pertaining to temporal, like, you know, over time.
but say you wanted to do like a more in-depth study of maybe one of the specific um, um, low growth areas, uh, do you think you would consider using a different uh, remote sensing platform such as either stationary or uh, like drone or air, aircraft based? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm a little wary of the uh, kites and balloons here in Wyoming, just for the how windy you know. That is fair. But if we could find a day where it wasn't going to be very windy, I would love to use one. I think they're fascinating. Um, I know that the the nine H ranch, they're a big fan of drones. So that like if if uh if they want more in depth analyses and they'd be willing to, you know, help provide access to a drone, then that'd be great. Um, but definitely, uh, those other types of platforms could only be used for like looking in the current and the future variations. If we want to look at the past, satellites are really the only option. True. You have to plan a drone mission ahead of time. Yeah. That's really good. And I don't want to lose the opportunity to do some shameless self-promotion. <laughs> so start to the next slide, so if you are wondering. Uh, so these are the classes that both Devon and Anna uh, completed. So I teach it in a sequence. Uh, so the first class is taught in fall. So that's where I identify nuggets like this one that I can say, would you like to come back in for spring to continue your research? That's what they are doing now. I have 13 of them in the class, and uh, I wish I could bring all of them to present their work, um, but sometime. But again, uh, I also want to let the students who are here and also online, um, the GIST program offers two undergrad certificates uh, in remote sensing and in GIS. So I left the address for the GIST director if anybody is interested. Uh, please contact her. And by the way, Anna and uh, Devon are both completing their certificate in remote sensing as well. So thank you so much for having us. Joining online. And so if you have any questions, suggestions, you know, please feel free to send them to me. I will pass it to them. Okay, thank you.